Hi, this is Lejeune with Lejeune Singleton LLC, Fitness, Health, Nutrition, and Wellness Podcast. Today, I would like to welcome transformational speaker, consultant, wife, mother, and author of The Prescription is in the Dirt, Fatima C. Oliver. Thank you for joining me, Fatima. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Lejeune. I really do appreciate it. Great platform, and I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. So can you give a background on yourself? Yeah, so I'll try to be brief because I'm a talker, but I am, you said everything that matters most, a wife, a mother, to them, that's all that matters. (laughs) I kind of do some other stuff, but um, I um, was in a family of all boys. I was the only girl out of five brothers. And um, so that was special. And then um, God clearly has a sense of humor because he gave me all boys. So I have four boys. And um, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. And then we relocated um, to Charlotte where I spent eight years there. And and now um, I'm in Columbus. And so I've definitely been around a little bit. Um, growing up in um, a family with all boys, there definitely wasn't much room for um, emotional uh, acknowledgement, I would say. And it's just because that's how, I guess we raise our boys, or at least back in the day, you raise your boys to be tough as nails and uh, don't cry, don't show any type of emotion. And I just went in the fold. So unfortunately that impacted me um, as a child and growing up being disconnected from my emotions and dealing with a lot of stuff, growing up in a family where there was a single parent and she had the weight on everything on her shoulders and just living in a state of frustration, trying to take care of five, or in this case, it was four kids. And um, and it just was, it was tough. And so there was a lot of surviving that happened in my home, which is a lot, is the same for a lot of people, I am aware. Um, but it's just, you, you, you move on kind of like on autopilot. And that was uh, another thing that I'm thankful for to be able to be, have a mindset of, I can survive just about anything. Um, but then there's that other side that, again, just disconnected me from being able to process any type of situation that I would be going um, into or coming out of. And so um, those are the things that actually led me into um, therapy and uh, much later in my life, just being so disconnected from my own emotions, um, afraid to tap into what was really going on on the inside of me and um, really what was the undercurrent for a lot of anxiety and depression throughout my life. So you mentioned something that is very, very, very valuable when you said you learned to survive. And most families and individuals grow up and that's all they know is how to survive. They don't know what love looks like. They only know survival skills. Yeah. So yeah. how did you learn to learn to love? Because you have four beautiful sons, you're married. How are you able to realize, okay, I've survived this long. Now it's time for me to learn to love, starting with myself, to give that to my kids, to give that to my husband. What did that look like for you? Can you explain that? Well, shoot, I got it right the second time. <laughs> Not hey, okay, sometimes they say one, two strikes, three strikes. Yeah, so. Right, so I would definitely say I upgraded on that one, okay? Okay, but, congrats. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, I really live in a space where, like we, like we said repeatedly, of survival, and, and that was the type of atmosphere that I was in, and so... I found myself running from one situation to another situation that was just as bad, if not worse. And that's when I got married the day after my 21st birthday, like who mm. was that? And so not many people and and it, and make it and they make it. And so um, we, we were together for 12 years and we're married for nine years. And so I guess to be young and married, I lasted a long time, but it was definitely, um, a situation that I wish I would have had um, a foundation that could have, that I would have felt safe enough to listen to when they were telling me it was a bad decision. But because of my prior environment, I didn't want to listen to what anybody had to say. I just wanted to escape it. And so for me, 
that that um that pattern just continued until I was late into my 30s and I met my husband that I'm with now. But but during my my first marriage and even in dating relationships as my, in a, as a youth and as a young adult, I still didn't know what love was. And so as soon as um, a man said that they loved me and they cared for me and they wanted to take care of me or I felt that they were doing things that I didn't get in my own home, that was my identity of love. That's what love was. And so when I got into and I married and I and I realized that I was in a tumultuous situation, abuse and just craziness going on around me, I attached that to this must be what love is. This must be what love looks like. And unfortunately, I didn't really realize that my thinking was so backwards until I got with someone who was more balanced and who had come from same thing, pretty much a single a family home, but the, found, the, the foundation of that home was a little different. It was a little bit more balanced in areas where in my family, those areas weren't. And, it, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure everything in, in his home wasn't the best, but it's just in those key areas, he had more foundation. And so it was a day when he came to me and said, you know, the way that you operate when you get angry, the expecting me to, to put my hands on you, because that's what I was used to, mm -hmm. and, and having to have outrageous arguments instead of being able to just discuss the situations. I'm not used to that. That is just kind of irrational and I'm going to have to break up with you. And for me, that was just like, whoa, <laughs> like, what? Right, right, right. And that really was a door, like a awakening for me to say, I still don't know how to do it right, but clearly what I'm doing isn't right. And so now I need to try to figure out a way to relearn or just to learn for the first time. And that took a progress because I didn't get that way overnight. I didn't learn that what I was doing was detrimental and just behaviorally horrible until I was in my late 30s. So that meant I went 30 some years operating in this way. So it took, I'm glad it didn't take that long for me to change, but right, it right. definitely took some good amount, good five, six, probably even close to 10 years before I was at operating in a more healthier way. And, I, and with each year, of course, I've gotten better because I realized that the way that I was going it just wasn't right and it did not exhibit love. Now, my faith told me what love is. Love is patient, it's kind, you know, it's forgiving and, and all these beautiful things. But my upbringing, my, my atmosphere, my environment was not conducive to any of that growing up. So it really truly took me being around people who could show me in action what love really looks like for me to be able to bend to that. And that's definitely important um, in that process where you able to become more open and more vulnerable with your husband. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, growing up with all boys, there was no room for vulnerability. There was no room for openness. There was just, okay, I got to be rough and tough because I got brothers. And if I fall down, they don't care if I'm crying. Yeah, absolutely. And, and keep in mind that then I had boys. Right. Still in a home where sometimes I have to say, okay, look, I know I'm rough. I know we talk crazy in here, but I'm still a girl. Like for real, I really am a girl. <laughs> it's like these emotions are real. Like it, it's not like something that's abnormal. Girls act this way, right? I'm not tripping out. But but I um, just over time, um, being able to get more in tune with myself. And I also think because of how I grew up and, and the home that I live in, being able to have more women around me also helped balance me oh, yeah. and also helped me to understand that I wasn't an anomaly, that I truly did have similar emotions and behaviors and, um, you know, like girly things, just like other girls, right? There was nothing wrong with me. So yeah. it, it really was wonderful for me to be able to learn how to befriend women because that was also very strange for me i was used to always being around guys and i really naturally would get along better with guys why because i was always around guys mm -hmm. and so their their language their terminology how they talk or don't talk as much and and just um quick off the cuff that that's what i'm used to and and not all women are that way we're more complicated and so um i had to learn how to wrestle with that other side of me and learn to embrace that side of me also 
but um and but somewhere as far as the vulnerability i still didn't really give into that piece i always um believed that vulnerability meant that i was weak and that, again that that was because of my upbringing and because of just my lineage as far as the people that i had been around my entire life you know the mama nams the right. the the um play mamas and the play aunties in the neighborhood it was so many women that were doing it by themselves that they just had this gird of strength that you never saw them um you never saw them cry you never saw them discouraged they were always trying to make it happen so my examples were all of strength so whenever i felt disappointed or sad never seen anybody ever cry a woman ever cry around me I didn't know that it was okay to do that. And therefore I believe that it was weak, whether anybody told me it was or not, that's what I believed. And so even with my husband, it took a lot for me to be able to be vulnerable and be okay with being vulnerable, not feeling like insecure or that he was going to leave me because I showed vulnerability. And it really wasn't until I approached therapy where my therapist told me, Fatima, it's okay to feel. That's what you're supposed to do. You feel and 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 she, um, i'm grateful i have a christian therapist so we were able to discuss that for me i'm a christian and and jesus is the center of my life and so as a reference point jesus had feelings jesus got angry when he went into the temple and saw that there was gambling in the house of, of prayer um he got emotional when it was time for him to sacrifice himself on the cross he got discouraged when he saw his his tribe his people his disciples sleeping on the job while he, when he needed them to hold him up. And so he had emotions and he expressed every emotion. He cried when Lazarus died. He felt every type of emotion. And so it was that reality check of saying, if, if Jesus can feel all those emotions, then why can't I allow myself to feel emotions? And that's really when I had that moment where I was able to truly be aware, like the light bulb went off in my head. And I was able to be aware that it is okay and stop fighting against the emotion and allow them to flow. Because I'll tell you something, Lejeune, the, the, the thing is, if you're not able to allow those negative or disturbing um, um, feelings flow, then you won't be able to experience those joyous feelings. You won't be able to ex um, experience those joyous emotions because your feelings come through one funnel. And so a lot of times, we um, take in anger and we celebrate drama mm -hmm. in our community and, 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 you know, generationally probably even, but um, we celebrate the anger and the flipping out and the popping off at the mouth and everything is shady. Nothing can be just, I'm telling you the truth and love, everything is coming um, shady or we keeping it 100, but that means being rude. And right. so we tend to lean so much on rude behavior, mean behavior, and just outrageous, dramatic behavior. But I believe all of that is just um, the surface or covering up a lot of hurt and a lot of misunderstanding or, or insecurity um, and just its own vulnerability. There's plenty that could be in there. And if we're not able to express all of that stuff and be able to sit and say, I'm feeling insecure or I'm feeling less than, or I'm feeling invisible, or this breaks my heart, or this hurt my feelings, if we're not able to express it and allow ourselves to feel it, then when something amazing happens, a lot of times we shortchange ourselves in the celebration and we feel funny to celebrate. We feel cheesy if we really are happy and proud of ourselves because it don't take all that, you know? And, and it's just such a disservice on who we are as a human. And like I said, God gave us those feelings and he, he felt them himself. So, what makes us think that we're too good or we're better than him to not be able to embrace our emotions? And it was something that you said, you know, about celebrating ourselves. We don't celebrate ourselves. We wait for other people to cheer us on and to celebrate us instead of celebrating ourselves. Our expectations is receiving it from others. Yeah. That's backwards because if you don't get that pat on the back, you have to be okay with your wins because yeah. everybody is not where you are and everybody is not going to cheer for you or be your number one fan. And you have to be okay with it and push forward. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And I think to that, to add to that, two things. Number one, you're absolutely right. We have to learn to be able to celebrate ourselves in the way that we want to be celebrated. Yes. We know how we want to be celebrated. We can't expect somebody else to celebrate us then we didn't give them the memo on what on what we need that makes us feel special. Right, right, right. So they're just picking at straws, trying to right. come do it right. And you're like, mm -mm, that ain't it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that ain't it, right? right. And I used to be that way so crazily in my 20s. And, and I, I really just think it all stemmed from feeling lack of worth and lack of value and not ha having really having anybody around that enforced my value as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, when you're in that place where you're impressionable, I didn't really have that. And I understand why, but still I didn't have it. So I was always, when it came to like a birthday or something, I was just like, celebrate me, celebrate me, celebrate me. And if one person did not call me or say happy birthday or something, it would deflate my entire day. And it wasn't until I was in the hospital with my first child and um, having complications and I was in the hospital on my birthday and not one person on my fa in my family came to see me. Oh. And I was in the hospital and the nurses got together and they bought me this huge cupcake that looked like a mini cake and they sang happy birthday to me. But for me, that moment said, Fatima, you have to celebrate yourself. Clearly, you're not at the top of the list on people's <laughs> list. You have to learn to celebrate yourself. And since then, and my husband will say, I take it to the extreme now, but I will have a whole week. I'm like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing it, <laughs> I'm going to do it. But even, even beyond that, just, um, just the things that happen in your life. If you do something that you've been working hard on, uh, on your job and you accomplish it, being able to take yourself out and, and buy ice cream. What is it that makes you happy? Even if you don't have a lot of money, go to McDonald's and get the fudge, you know, Sunday that day when you normally wouldn't get it. Do something to, to make yourself feel special for your accomplishment and not allow other people, um, not, not put that power in other people's hands. But I also think it's critical to understand, I think to your point, is that not everybody is in your space and not everybody knows how to celebrate themselves. So to expect oh. somebody else to celebrate you when they're fighting their own fight is really um, unfair. You know, I think we're all in the same type of fight, whether we are acknowledging it or not. And so to be looking on somebody else to give you more than what they give themselves, to me is a form of emotional manipulation. You have to know what you want and you have to do it for yourself as best as you can. And be and you may not be where you want to be, but be grateful for where you are. And like I said, if that means you only got one candle that you can put on a cake or on a cupcake, if you do something amazing, you should celebrate that win. And I've struggled with that in my life as far as celebrating my wins because most of my life I've lived again as a as a survivor survivor, and that meant a checklist. Did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? Okay, good. I got all of that taken care of. And it wasn't a matter of relax, take that in, you did it. It was, okay, now what's next, right? right. And right. so many of us live on that, okay, now what's next, that we don't stop and embrace the moment of accomplishment in our own lives. And then we walk around feeling unfulfilled because we don't recognize our win. We can't see when we're winning. And also we get disappointed when we don't check that list off. Yeah. So for sure. <laughs> Let's get into this book. What was the motivation behind the prescriptions in the dirt and why? <laughs> so the prescription is in the dirt. Yeah, my first novel. And it really came about um, due to my own struggles with every, every piece of my life. Um, I've struggled with anxiety and depression since I was a child. I didn't even know that that's what it was. And um, I was burnt at two years old, have 25% of my body has um, burns on them because of a, a, a hot water accident. And so I had to learn at two years old how to eat, walk and talk all over again. So that type of shock at two. Right. And then from there, going into homes where there was physical abuse and sexual abuse and, you know, of course, verbal, emotional abuse right. and just being in a in a home where, you know, my my mom did the best she could, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And so in that, I picked up these horrible behavioral habits and I picked up this horrible view of myself 
And so in each relationship that I have as a mother, as a wife, as a sibling, as a friend, um, even as a Christian, and just as a woman, I had such horrible thoughts about myself um, to the point where there have been plenty of times where I've considered suicide or and there have been times in my in my younger age where I tried suicide. And so the book gives me an opportunity to shed light on all of that, which was my life. A lot of that is shared in the book as far as where I was at, the depth of the dirt that I was that I was trying to climb out of, um, the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the abuse of a of a husband, the loss of a child, all these type of things are wrapped inside the book and basically it shows how I was able to figure out a way to come up out of it with God's help as my center. And we all have our own dirt. My dirt is wrapped into a book. I didn't share everything, but I shared a lot. <laughs> Some embarrassing stuff is in the book, um, but, but that's my dirt. And the thing about dirt is that if we're not careful, it can bury us. I like to say the analogy of the grave in regards that it can be used to just cover us and bury us alive and we can be functioning in life, but we're not really making any type of ground. Relationally, our relationships are strained. We're disconnected emotionally. We can't see no future for us. We just clock in and clock out and we have no hope and we feel like we have no purpose. And so that's what dirt can do when you don't dig and see what the heck is going on with me. I can have anxiety attacks at the job um, why do I have that? And then try to peel back the layer of what happened, what triggered that anxiety, and why do I always feel that way? And where did that come from? That's the type of peel in a way that I'm talking about. And if we don't dig in there and that dirt, those things in our lives, we will walk around as functional zombies. But the great thing about the dirt is that if we allow God or our faith to get in the middle of any situation that we're going through, whether it was life trauma from when we were a child, whether it was a divorce or if, if it was some of the things that I talked about, the loss of a child or a horrible accident that has caused you disfigured, any type of thing, if we allow God to get in the middle of it and help us to deal with the process and the emotional trauma of each event, the triggers that can still come up and make us feel like a horrible person, if we allow God to get in there and help us to process it, then he can use it as soil and grow something beautiful from it. And I believe that's what he's done in my life. Um, it was not an easy road. It actually took um, a lot of time. I would say at least a good, well, shoot, all of last year, I really focused in that area and I'm continuing to focus, but um, that was sincere focus. But I have been on this journey for at least a good, um, probably four years. It's just, um, the last two years, it was really, really in-depth, radical transformation. And um, when you allow that transformation to happen, what I consider to be soul healing, a soul healing process to happen from the inside out and not worry so much about the cosmetic, cosmetic stuff, but, but what's going on with your soul and with your heart and with your body and your mind and your spirit, all of that together, you can find purpose in your life. It's just a matter of um, doing the tough work and it definitely is tough work, but it's worth it. And definitely what you said is when it comes to digging dirt, what I say to people, I fear God, myself, the IRS, and prison. Yeah. And myself, because you can self-sabotage yourself yeah. unintentionally because you're holding on to that toxic past. Yeah. And right. as you definitely said, that soil, getting that soil to grow into something positive and not being stuck in that toxic past and realizing, you know, the things that trigger you, that is definitely important. Yeah. And the one, the main reason why I wrote the book is really, it, I was in a space where God had brought me out of a lot and it really was just an, another extension of therapy for me. It was a way for me to finally speak and say, my name is Fatima. I have a voice. My story matters. It mattered when I was 11 years old and nobody was listening to me. It mattered when I was 19 or, or 18 and I was saying something's wrong with me, but people were enabling me and telling me, girl, ain't nothing wrong with you. My story has always mattered and it may not have mattered to those people. You know, they have their own stuff, but it definitely mattered to God. And he gave me my voice back. He gave me the courage to be able to speak on it. 
And then um, it, the, the other part of it was to be able to be a voice for those people who haven't found theirs yet, to be able to speak on taboo topics that normally people would say it would shame the family or it would shame the church or it would shame yourself and your friends and your and you're like I don't know if anybody's going to like me after I put this out there but but it was my story to tell and um and we all have our story to tell but there are people who are just now walking through their process and so I wanted to be able to stand up for them and say you know I'm speaking for you this is what happens you know, and sometimes in the family, these are things that happen. Sometimes in the church, these are situations that occur. And that doesn't mean that God isn't God, uh, even in life. It doesn't mean that God isn't God. It just means that, you know, clearly there's something else out there for you. If you're still breathing on this earth, if you can breathe in and out, then clearly there's still something for you. There's still a purpose. And so when I wrote the book, it really was about my healing my continuous healing, but also trying to help others to heal also. And speaking of that, who is your target audience, your clients that you work with? Yeah, well, it really is. It, it varies. I really want to say I, I don't necessarily like to say it's really this person or that person, because truly everybody needs healing in one facet or another. And so my goal is to be able to provide people action steps not just motivation to say you can do it you can conquer what has been conquering you because that's really what we're talking about we're right. talking about things that trigger you events that trigger you into um anger into going back into grieving into and you can grieve anything whether it's the heartbreak going back into reliving that heartbreak from a a bad relationship or a loss of a job where you felt you gave your all and then this is what you get out of it so it's my my task is to give people action items to change the trajectory of their lives to be able to say yes these things did happen to you but you no longer have to be victimized by it you can literally make a decision to change your life but it first starts with your thinking and so in that anybody can use that right i because i'm a female naturally women gravitate to me but you would be surprised how many men have requested to talk to me and to have interviews with me and who do not shy away from the conversations where i would think sometimes i would catch myself trying to um, change my my words because I don't want to gross them out, but they don't care. They want to talk about it. And I think that is wonderful because that means that there are some men out there who are trying to prepare themselves to help their woman to grow and to help their woman to come out of some stuff, come out of their own dirt. So I commend that. Any guy that reaches out to me wants to talk. But but truly, um, I have a website and on my website, there are just courses that are um, how do you say it? Um, I can't think of the, the word. Uh, what is it? I can't think of the word. But when it's like um, a guy can wear it and a girl can wear it. It's oh, like, unisex. Unisex. So the items that are on my website are unisex. Okay. If you are hurting, hurting doesn't have a gender, right? Hurt is hurt. And so uh, your heart is your heart. And if you are hurting and you need some help, um, you need to know how to be there for somebody else. Um, you need to know how to handle your angry outbursts. You need to know how to stop comparing yourself. You need to figure out how to start journaling because you got all these thoughts in your head, but you don't know where to start. Those tools are on my website. And actually all those things that I just spoke of are free resources that are on my website. All you gotta do is look under free resources. But I also offer that one-on-one -on -one, um, intimacy to where you can work through a study guide. And these study guides are usually about like 10 studies, 10 courses, and in each course, you'll get about six um, breakdowns of many courses. And you can definitely do them yourself. That's what they're there for. But there, there's something about having community and there's something about having somebody to walk alongside you when you're doing something so vulnerable and i really believe um i really believe in lejeune the the gift that is in having a safe place to fall meaning somebody that's around who you can vent to who you can process with when you start peeling back those layers in your own life and seeing some stuff that you thought you had resolved and it's like whoa i'm still angry and upset about that 
you need somebody there to can help you talk through that stuff. And so that's where I come along with my clients to be able to basically pull them back off the ledge and we sit and we have that dialogue, that necessary dialogue and, and when allowed, you know, definitely give them feedback and some insight and, and even prayer if they request it. And that support is important because dealing with that heavy stuff of your past and you start to relive it. Right. And if you don't know how to process it and you don't have the tools or you don't have that professional therapist or coach or consultant that's there to help you through that process, you start to relive it and start to go into a dark place. And I think that is definitely important providing that one-on-one support because that's needed and most people don't have support and that's how they end up in those extremely dark places or they have people in that same situation that's not positive and it's that negativity yeah and 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 that's why i lean on you know one of my one of the key things i tell people when i number one i say that it's a baby step approach and the reason why i call it a baby step approach to healing is because you're going to stumble just like a baby you try to walk you fall right Right. you ain't got it together but you're trying you're trying and eventually you're going to get your legs up under you and you're going to be able to do this thing and you're going to be able to go and you'll have the tools and the resource and you'll be able to say thank you fatima you helped me i got it from here right but in the beginning, it's baby steps. And in the, that moment where you're operating on baby steps, it is critical to have a safe place to fall. And you are right. People don't, a lot of people don't venture into self-reflection because they're afraid of having a conversation with a group of people that they hang out with all the time, but haven't had an intimate conversation. And because they're concerned about the person looking at them as them being crazy or saying you too deep for me, or you just too sensitive, they're afraid of all these comments. So they just keep it to themselves. But the, 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 the trick, um, uh, I feel like it's almost like an inner suicide or like a cancer, maybe I should say, is holding all that stuff inside of you. It just deteriorates you. It causes extra stress. It messes with your body. You don't want to eat or you eat too much. You get in, you, you start breaking out. You get back pain. All kind of crazy stuff can happen when stress sets in. But when you're holding all that emotion and all this junk in of events that happen to you, that you're not allowing yourself to talk through and get it out of you, that's the type of stuff that happens. And so a safe place to fall means somebody or a group of people who you know that you can have your hair all over the place, your your house look a hot mess, you're snotting all over the place, you got the same clothes on from a couple of days ago, yet somebody will come in and help clean your house, will pray for you and with you and sit with you and talk with you and help you to understand that you are not crazy, that you are just having a moment like we all do and that they're gonna help you walk through it and get any necessary help that you need. That is a safe place, a a complete no judgment zone. And Lejeune, you ain't gotta worry about your stuff going nowhere when you're done talking to them. You ain't gotta worry about such and such knowing something that they ain't got no business knowing. So that's the safe place and everybody needs a safe place when you're going through um, something so, I say it's radical because you really can, um, it's awesome how much you can change your life, but to everything, change is necessary and you cannot have comfort and change at the same time. So there are going to be some very uncomfortable moments going through this transitional phase and re- redirecting your life. And when you're going through that, you know, like you, you made that point, you just really want to make sure that you have some support that's going to not just give you um, the truth and love, but support you when you make progress. When somebody call you and you know that you usually trigger when they call you and then they call you and you don't cuss them out, you should be celebrated. (laughs) You should be celebrated. You should not have to just take that in and say, I didn't even cuss them out and go by your day. No, honey, you stop and you celebrate that because that is progress. And that is what um, a good support system will give you. That is what I will give you. And, and that's normally what I give to my clients. Okay. So what does health and wellness mean to you? Health and wellness, for me, especially with what I have struggled through my entire life, health and wellness is truly my mental health. Um, I feel like that is 
if it doesn't come first, it's definitely at the top of the list. I should have said my spiritual health. I know God, my bad, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> that do come first for me. But also mental health is very important to me. And that's because of my own struggles. And just because I went through this process of my soul healing journey, where I looked at my mess and I looked at the hard truths of my life and I faced it hard, um, head on and I dissected every single thing that still made me get riled up when I thought about it. It doesn't mean that I still don't struggle with anxiety and depression. Right. That is something that I continue to wrestle. And so I just have better tools now and I have better resources and I'm stronger because a lot of that junk is no longer attached to that behavioral, I guess, you know, thing that came with uh, the events. And so I continue to use um, different methods that I've learned over the years and ways to keep me balanced and keep me um, centered, emotionally balanced. And then also being able to get out and run. I enjoy running out, actually start. It wasn't feeling too good um, today, really last week either. And today, yesterday it snowed a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. but, but starting tomorrow, I'll be able to get back on the pavement and start running. I'm not a professional runner at all but I definitely enjoy being out there on the pavement and taking in the air and just going for a little jog and just allowing God to talk to me in that moment. Health and wellness, I think should be anything that helps you to get back centered. Whatever it is that you can do to help you get back in control of you, um, where you're able to silence out the distractions. So for some people that could be meditation. For me, it's my prayer, I pray. Um, and make intentional time to pray. Um, and then from there, I may go for a jog or something like that. Um, but it's anything that can center you. And, and nowadays we're so busy that we get away from being centered until all you know what breaks loose. And then we wanna be able to say, okay, I need to, I just need to think, I just need to pray. I just need to, you know, we wanna be able to have those things in place before the, the, the drama happens, right? So how do you balance career, family, and your personal time? Ta, that's funny. Yeah, that, that's a trick question for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I do a lot. I mean, and uh, it's one of those things where I believe that you have to accept that you cannot do everything perfect, everything the best all the time. Something is going to lag. And so um, there has to be a conscious decision and understanding in that. So when I'm in school, I just got out of school. I just got my MBA. I'm excited about that. So, thank you, girl. That was a rough one. But <laughs> but while I was in school, my family knew I was in school and they understood what that meant. And so for me, that meant I can't go out and hang out all the time. I can't go to the movies. I can't go to the restaurants and have date nights as many as I would, as much as I would want to. Sometimes movie night involves me sitting on the couch and doing my my schoolwork while I'm in the room with the family and and trying my best to watch it and do school. And so for some that would they would say, "Oh my god, that is just so not quality." But I can't do everything perfect all together. Right. But my kids know that at least I was in the room with them, right? And I could try to engage. And so um, I think it, it really does boil down to doing the best that I can with what I have and making sure that what is priority in that moment remains priority. If I'm having a date night with my husband and I know that it's, he wants a date night, then I can't do anything that I got on the computer for very long. I have to sh shut it down and accept where I have to stop and give him my time and not be with him on my phone or still trying to get stuff done. I have to be in the moment. And so that is the best way that I juggle, if we want to say, because I'm always multitasking. I'm always doing something, especially with the pandemic. I'm working from home and I'm teaching my kids and I'm yelling at one and then I'm talking on a conference call. I'm always doing something. And so it really is sometimes where I have to stop and breathe and, and recenter myself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to tell them when you have lunch, that means go away from mommy. I don't want you over here having lunch. I've been with you for three hours still. And now you want to have lunch and still stay over here. No, go outside, go do something. I need some space so that I don't snap and, and take out my frustrations on them. And so that's the best that I could say about balancing. I think we're always balancing and juggling things, 
most what's critical to me is being able to be in the moment and showing up when you're in whatever it is that you're doing in that moment to show up when I'm at work, when somebody's talking to me, I stop what I'm doing and I make a point to look at them in the eyes because in that moment, I want them to feel value. And that's what I want, you know? And so those type of things I think helps, uh, it helps me look like I'm balancing so well, even though, even though sometimes in my head, I'm like, oh my God, I just need a break. And sometimes that's just how life is, you know? Okay. So how do you provide self-care? Self-care. So again, it really boils down to making intentional time. Um, For me, my self-care first starts with God. And so I make intentional time to have my prayer time with God. And that's really the meditation time of singing my worship songs and then allowing God to speak to me. For me, that is huge self-care because there is nothing like having peace of mind. And that's just for me. And then, um, and then going for a job, girl, don't nobody in my family want to go with me. They find everything else to do, <laughs> but to go with me. So that is really my time. And so when I'm able to meet a goal and say, okay, I want to run three miles a day, or I'm going to do six miles and, and I make that goal for me, that is like huge self-care for me because I did that. And so I'm already walking back in the house feeling accomplished. Um, I stay away from shopping because I had an emotional shopping addiction. Norm- back in the day, if you'd ask me, I would have said, I go shopping. <laughs> but but no, I really try to stay away from that. And that is also another form of self-care for me, because that means that when I get frustrated and when I get upset, I'm dealing with my real emotions and I'm not masking them and going to the movies or going to go grocery shopping. And I know we don't need no groceries. I just need to I need to use that as a way as a soother. And so I'm grateful that my self-care has shifted a little bit. It's not as, um, I guess, tangible, if you want to say, or mm-hmm. materialistic. It really is more soul, um, soul and spirit centered. Okay. And what advice or recommendations would you offer other women and men in regards to letting go of their past trauma, triggers, and behaviors well i would definitely say you know a lot of times we we get in the habit of saying um just forget the past just forget it and move on but i really venture to go the opposite way and that may be a little unpopular but i believe that just like with anything if you were in a a sport and you pulled a hamstring or you um injured your finger and you didn't get it taken care of and you just said wrapped it for a little bit and then you took the bandage off you never went to the doctor to see if anything was broken you just took care of it yourself and then you got back out there you could re-injure that and it would make it even worse because you didn't take the proper care in the beginning and so you could go years actually and re-injure that same spot that you messed with that same hamstring from ages ago that you thought was over with. Why? Because you're still doing similar activity on something that you didn't take care of. And that's the same with the heart. That's the same with your soul, right? Um, You have to go back and deal with the emotional attachments, those triggers that it's basically triggers, the triggers Mm -hmm. that bring upon the emotions from those events that you have um, had in your life. If you are still sitting around with your girlfriends or with your buddies or in the car or when you're by yourself. And if you are still getting riled up over certain events, it's still making you pissy mad or making you so upset and sad. Those are issues that you need to address. And so to address those, what I would say three things is number one, find a safe place. You need somebody to be able to that you talk with and that you can share freely with and they don't judge you no matter how dark your comment is, no matter how drastic, they're not over here calling Popo talking about y'all need to pick her up. <laughs> they're, right, they're right, right. You, right? That's number one. You got to make sure that you have a safe place. Number two, I would say you got to make a decision that if you really want to heal and you're tired of crying over that thing, you're tired of getting so angry and just obnoxiously crazed over that thing, then you got to be willing to face the truth of it. And is the truth that you had something to do with it that caused it to go wrong? Or is it the truth that they were just horrible people to begin with and they should not have even been a part of your life? 
is the truth that life just happens and some things you just will never understand. You have to face the truth and you have to make that decision that you're going to face the truth because a lot of times we say it and then when it's time, it gets painful and we turn away and we say, nah, that's as much as I want. And so you got to make that decision. And then thirdly, I would say that you this is the tough one, but you have to release being a victim. Mm -hmm. And that is can be very tough. And I admit for me, that was one of the toughest ones for me to have to release. And the reason is because I downright was a victim. There were things that happened to me that absolutely I had no control over and that were not my fault. However, holding on to it forever and allowing that thing to prevent me from trying to change my life and to prevent me from moving forward in my life, that was my fault. And so you have to be willing to say, yes, those things happened to me, but I'm more than those things. Yes, I was a, I was a burn victim. Yes, I, I am um, a, a mother who lost a child. Yes, I'm a, I was an abused wife. I was sexually abused. I was a victim in those things. However, they do no longer, they no longer define me. Right. I am also a survivor and I am a, a, a beautiful person and I am awesome and I am cool and, and I am strong and I am determined and I am persistent. Um, all these other things that God said I am. And so I couldn't, as you see, Lejeune, when I started talking about it, I started smiling and laughing and you right. can see it's coming from the inside. It's not me just popping something off at the mouth, right? Uh, you know, I'm not just saying I'm a queen, I wear a crown. I mean that because I earned that crown. But that's the whole point of letting go of self-victimization. You can't have both. So right. you got to be able to release the fact that, yes, you used to be a victim, but you got to be able to release it and say, but I'm not going to be that anymore. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do by any means necessary to rewrite my story and to make my story the story I want it to be about. I want to be able to earn that crown as a queen so that when I say I am that, I am that because a queen has poise and a queen makes unpopular decisions. Even though they're the best decisions, they are oftentimes unpopular. And a queen is a servant and has compassion for other people. So you got to be able to make room for all of that. So I would definitely say those three things would definitely help anybody to be able to get on the right path towards changing some immense, some huge things in their life. And I love what you said, that whole victim mentality will not help you grow yeah. as a person. Being stuck in that uh, woe is me cannot help you move forward. I definitely love that. Yeah, so, it, yes, very true. I mean, unfortunately, it, and we want to hold on to it because we've been telling ourselves the story for so long. We've been saying, but they hurt me, though. They did hurt me. And nobody is saying that they did not. And that is not what I'm saying. But I am saying we know it, but now what? Exactly. Now what? And so the ball is in your court to be able to determine what that now what is. So do you have any upcoming events or projects that you're working on? Yes, and I'm so excited that you asked me that. <laughs> so, so yes, on um, next week, April 10th, actually, I will be hosting a virtual event and it is called Crushing the Elephants. And so mm -hmm. what that is, is basically tapping on the things that we've talked about, just the different events that happen in our life, the different conversations that we maybe should be having, but we're afraid to have because we don't want to hurt that person's feelings. Or we don't want to hurt our own feelings, so we won't face the truth, you know? Right, um, right. Just different situations, different truths in our lives that we've kind of avoided and to the point where we're miserable. And so we're going to be talking about those things. I'm going to go first and share some things that have happened in my life, but I want the person, um, my audience to leave with some tangible, some action items to be able to change their atmosphere. And so we will also be really diving into the fear of confrontation when really it's not about the fear of confrontation. It really is the fear of not, um, of your opinion, not being accepted. And so we will be discussing how to have an effective confrontation, if you want to call it to me, a conversation, an effective conversation right. to where you can voice your opinion, your viewpoint in a healthy way, understanding that you cannot control that person. The only person you can control is yourself and really coming from that space of your behavior when you're having 
a tough conversation. And so in that, you'll be able to go and face those situations in your life and say, nope, this cannot happen anymore. So I'm excited about that. It'll be on April 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's um, a virtual event and you can go to my website, FatimaC.com and um, be able to register to be a part of it. I'm gonna be giving out uh, free autograph books to anybody who signs up. And so um, that is, yeah, that's a good deal. I'm just saying you can go to, uh, go to uh, Amazon and see how much books cost, okay? And my book is there and I have some awesome reviews. I just wanna tell you, and it ain't mom and them that gave me the review. These are real people <laughs> gave me the review, okay? And so <laughs> you can go to, um, you can go to FatimaC.com again and you'll be able to um, register for the event and, and receive your, um, your free autograph book in the mail shortly after. Okay. And speaking of your book, you mentioned Amazon. Is there any other place that listeners can buy your book? Yeah, right now it is solely or exclusively being sold through Amazon. You can go on my website also and um, click there and it'll just lead you back to Amazon, but you can receive it in Kindle format. And you can also get it in paperback. And if you have a membership and you love to read and you have a membership with Amazon, you can even borrow the book, I believe, and get it for free. So um, yeah, you can definitely, if you're not really interested yet in, in being a part of the event, if that doesn't work with you, you can definitely get the book at any time and you can always schedule some time to talk with me later. Okay. And how can someone reach you for services? Yeah, so you can reach me again at FatimaC.com and um, go and look up appointments and you'll see my calendar there and you can schedule some time with me. You can even use the WhatsApp that's linked on my website and, and get right in touch with me. But you can also find me on social media and message me. And I'm on LinkedIn. I am on Facebook. I'm on Instagram and I'm even on Reddit. So oh. I don't do that much on Reddit, <laughs> but I am on Reddit. You can find me. And so just look me up, Fatima C. Oliver. Um, reach out to me. There's definitely a way to get in touch with me and I will respond. Well, I thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing your story. Um, definitely check out her book. Check out her event. I'm definitely going to register to check it out because that sounds very, <laughs> very, very powerful because I've experienced past trauma and things, sexual assault and things like that. So please check her out. Until next time, this is LeJune Singleton with LeJune Singleton LLC. And thank you again, Fatima C. Oliver. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me, honey.